Pergamon, Wikipedia article audio. Pergamon slash P. R. G. M. N slash or slash P. R. G. M. N slash or Pergamum slash P. R. G. M. M slash was a rich and powerful ancient Greek city in Aeolis. It is located 26 kilometers from the modern coastline of the Aegean Sea on a promontory on the north side of the river Caicos and northwest of the modern city of Bergama. Location History Pre-Hellenistic Period Hellenistic Period Roman Period Byzantine Period Pergamon in Myth History of Research and Excavation Infrastructure and Housing Housing Open Spaces Streets and Bridges Water Supply Main Sites Upper Acropolis Pergamon Altar Theater Temple of Dionysus Temple of Athena Library Trigenium Other Structures Lower Acropolis Sanctuary of Hera at the foot of the Acropolis Sanctuary of Asclepius During the Hellenistic period, it became the capital of the Kingdom of Pergamon under the Adelid dynasty in 281-133 BC, who transformed it into one of the major cultural centers of the Greek world. Many remains of its impressive monuments can still be seen and especially the outstanding masterpiece of the Pergamon Altar. Pergamon is cited in the Book of Revelation as one of the seven churches of Asia. Serapis Temple Inscriptions The city centers around a 335-meter high mesa of Andesite, which formed its Acropolis. This mesa falls away sharply on the north, west, and east sides, but three natural terraces on the south side provide a route up to the top. To the west of the Acropolis, the Selenus River flow through the city, while the Cedius passes by to the east. Notable People Pergamon lies on the north edge of the Caicos Plain in the historic region of Mysia in the northwest of Turkey. The Caicos River breaks through the surrounding mountains and hills at this point and flows in a wide arc to the southwest. At the foot of the mountain range to the north, between the rivers Selenus and Cedius, there is the massif of Pergamon which rises 335 meters above sea level. The site is only 26 kilometers from the sea, but the Caicos Plain is not open to the sea, since the way is blocked by the Karadag Massif. As a result, the area has a strongly inland character. In Hellenistic times, the town of Alea at the mouth of the Caicos served as the port of Pergamon. The climate is Mediterranean with a dry period from May to August as is common along the west coast of Asia Minor. The Caicos Valley is mostly composed of volcanic rock, particularly andesite, and the Pergamon Massif is also an intrusive stock of andesite. The massif is about 1 km wide and around 5.5 km long from north to south. It consists of a broad, elongated base and a relatively small peak, the upper city. The side facing the Cedius River is a sharp cliff, while the side facing the Selenus is a little rough. On the north side, the rock forms a 70 m wide spur of rock. To the southeast of this spur, which is known as the Garden of the Queen, the massif reaches its greatest height and breaks off suddenly immediately to the east. The upper city extends for another 250 m to the south but it remains very narrow, 
with a width of only 150 m. At its south end the massif falls gradually to the east and south, widening to around 350 m and then descends to the plain towards the southwest. Settlement of Pergamon can be detected as far back as the Archaic period, thanks to modest archaeological finds, especially fragments of pottery imported from the west, particularly eastern Greece and Corinth, which date to the late 8th century BC. Earlier habitation in the Bronze Age cannot be demonstrated, although Bronze Age stone tools are not absent from the surrounding area. The earliest mention of Pergamon in literary sources comes from Xenophon S. Anabasis, since the march of the 10,000 under Xenophon's command ended at Pergamon in 400-399 BC. Xenophon, who calls the city Pergamos, handed over the rest of his Greek troops to Thybron, who was planning an expedition against the Persian satraps Tissaphernes and Pharnabasius at this location in March 399 BC. At this time Pergamon was in the possession of the family of Gongyles from Eritrea and Xenophon was hosted by his widow Hellas. In 362 BC, Orontes, satrap of Mysia, based his revolt against the Persian Empire at Pergamon, but was crushed. Only with Alexander the Great was Pergamon and the surrounding area removed from Persian control. There are few traces of the pre-Hellenistic city, since in the following period the terrain was profoundly changed and the construction of broad terraces involved the removal of almost all earlier structures. Parts of the Temple of Athena, as well as the walls and foundations of the altar in the sanctuary of Demeter go back to the 4th century. Lysimachus, king of Thrace, took possession in 301 BC, but soon after his lieutenant Philetaris enlarged the town, the kingdom of Thrace collapsed in 281 BC and Philetaris became an independent dynast. His family, the Adelids ruled Pergamon from 281 until 133 BC, Philetaris 281 263, Eumenes I 263 241, Adelis I 241 197, Eumenes 2197 159, Adelis 2159 138, Adelis 3 138 133. The domain of Philetaris was limited to the area surrounding the city itself, but you means I was able to expand them greatly. In particular, after the Battle of Sardis in 261 BC against Antiochus I, you means was able to appropriate the area down to the coast and some way inland. The city thus became the center of a territorial realm, but you means did not take the royal title. This final step was only taken by his successor Attalus I, after he defeated the Galatians in 238, whom Pergamon had paid tribute to under Eumenes I. Only at this point did an entirely independent Pergamon kingdom come into existence, which would reach its greatest power and territorial extent in 188 BC. The Attalids became some of the most loyal supporters of Rome in the Hellenistic world. Under Attalus I, they allied with Rome against Philip V of Macedon, during the First and Second Macedonian Wars. In the Roman Seleucid War against the Seleucid king Antiochus III, Pergamon joined the Romans' coalition and was rewarded with almost all the former Seleucid domains in Asia Minor at the Peace of Apamea in 188 BC. Eumenes II supported the Romans again, against Perseus of Macedon, in the Third Macedonian War, but the Romans did not reward Pergamon for this. On the basis of a rumor that Eumenes had entered into negotiations with Perseus during the war, the Romans attempted to replace Eumenes II with the future Attalus II, but the latter refused. After this, 
Pergamon lost its privileged status with the Romans and was awarded no further territory by them. Nevertheless, under the brothers Eumenes II and Attalus II, Pergamon reached its apex and was rebuilt on a monumental scale. Until 188 BC, it had not grown significantly since its founding by Philaterus, and covered c. 21 hectares. After this year, a massive new city wall was constructed, 4 kilometers long and enclosing an area of approximately 90 hectares. The Adelaide's goal was to create a second Athens, a cultural and artistic hub of the Greek world. They remodeled the Acropolis of Pergamon after the Acropolis in Athens. Epigraphic documents survive showing how the Adelids supported the growth of towns by sending in skilled artisans and by remitting taxes. They allowed the Greek cities in their domains to maintain nominal independence. They sent gifts to Greek cultural sites like Delphi, Delos, and Athens. The Library of Pergamon was renowned as second only to the Library of Alexandria. Pergamon was also a flourishing center for the production of parchment, which had been used in Asia Minor long before the rise of the city. The story that parchment was invented by the Pergamonese because the Ptolemies in Alexandria had a monopoly on papyrus production is not true. The two brothers Eumenes II and Attalus II displayed the most distinctive trait of the Attalids, a pronounced sense of family without rivalry or intrigue, rare amongst the Hellenistic dynasties. Eumenes II and Attalus II were even compared to the mythical pair of brothers, Cleobus and Biton. When Attalus III died without an heir in 133 BC, he bequeathed the whole of Pergamon to Rome. This was challenged by Aristonicus who claimed to be Attalus III's brother and led an armed uprising against the Romans with the help of Blasus, a famous Stoic philosopher. For a period he enjoyed success, defeating and killing the Roman consul P. Licinius Crassus and his army, but he was defeated in 129 BC by the consul M. Perperna. The kingdom of Pergamon was divided between Rome, Pontus, and Cappadocia, with the bulk of its territory becoming the new Roman province of Asia. The city itself was declared free and was briefly the capital of the province, before it was transferred to Ephesus. In 88 BC, Mithridates VI made the city the headquarters in his first war against Rome, in which he was defeated. The result of this war was a stagnation in the development of the city. At the end of the war, the city was stripped of all its benefits and its status as a free city. Instead, the city was henceforth required to pay tribute, accommodate and supply Roman troops, and the property of many of the inhabitants was confiscated. The members of the Pergamon aristocracy, especially Diodorus Pasparus in the 70s BC, used their own possessions to maintain good relationships with Rome, by acting as donors for the development of city. Numerous honorific inscriptions indicate his work and his exceptional position in Pergamon at this time. Pergamon still remained a famous city and the noteworthy luxuries of Lucullus included imported wares from the city which continued to be the site of a conventus. Under Augustus, the first imperial cult, a neocorate, to be established in the province of Asia was in Pergamon. Pliny the Elder refers to the city as the most important in the province and the local aristocracy continued to reach the highest circles of power in the first century AD like Aulus Julius Quadratus who was consul in 94 and 105. Yet it was only under Trajan and his successors that a comprehensive redesign and remodeling of the city took place, with the construction of a Roman new city at the base of the Acropolis. The city was the first in the province to receive a second neocorate, from Trajan in AD 113-4.
Hadrian raised the city to the rank of metropolis in 123 and thereby elevated it above its local rivals, Ephesus and Smyrna. An ambitious building program was carried out, massive temples, a stadium, a theatre, a huge forum and an amphitheatre were constructed. In addition, at the city limits the shrine to Asclepius was expanded into a lavish spa. This sanctuary grew in fame and was considered one of the most famous therapeutic and healing centers of the Roman world. In the middle of the second century, Pergamon was one of the largest cities in the province, along with these two, and had around 200,000 inhabitants. Galen, the most famous physician of antiquity aside from Hippocrates, was born at Pergamon and received his early training at the Asclepian. At the beginning of the 3rd century, Caracalla granted the city a third neocorate, but the decline had already set in. During the crisis of the 3rd century, the economic strength of Pergamon finally collapsed, as the city was badly damaged in an earthquake in 262 and was sacked by the Goths shortly thereafter. In late antiquity, it experienced a limited economic recovery. Anatolia was invaded by the Persian Sassanid Empire in c.620 and after the Persians were driven out by Byzantine forces, Pergamon was rebuilt on a much smaller scale by Emperor Constans II. In AD 663-4, Pergamon was captured by raiding Arabs for the first time. As a result of this ongoing threat, the area of settlement retracted to the citadel, which was protected by a six-meter-thick wall built of spolia. Not long after, Pergamon was sacked again by the armies of Maslama ibn Abd al-Malik in 716. It was again rebuilt and refortified after the Arabs had departed to besiege Constantinople in 717. Under Leo III, Pergamon was part of the theme of Thrace, before being transferred to the theme of Samos under Leo VI. It suffered during the attacks of the Seljuks on western Anatolia after the Battle of Manzikert in 1071 but remained a wealthy city under the Byzantine emperors of the Komnian dynasty. Under Isaac II, the city was promoted to an archbishopric, having previously been a suffragan diocese of Ephesus. After the sack of Constantinople in 1204 during the Fourth Crusade, Pergamon became part of the Empire of Nicaea. When Emperor Theodore II Lascaris visited Pergamon in 1250, he was shown the house of Galen, but he saw that the theatre had been destroyed and, except for the walls which he paid some attention to, only the vaults over the Selenus seemed noteworthy to him. The monuments of the Adelids and the Romans were only plundered ruins by this time. With the expansion of the Anatolian Balix, Pergamon was absorbed into the Balak of Kara Sids by 1336, and then conquered by the Ottoman Balak in 1345. The Ottoman Sultan Murad III had two large alabaster urns transported from the ruins of Pergamon and placed on two sides of the nave in the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Pergamon, which traced its founding back to Telephus, the son of Heracles, is not mentioned in Greek myth or epic of the archaic or classical periods. However, in the epic cycle the Telephos myth is already connected with the area of Mysia. He comes there following an oracle in search of his mother, and becomes Tuthra's son-in-law or foster son and inherits his kingdom of Tuthrania, which encompassed the area between Pergamon and the mouth of the Caicus. Telephus refused to participate in the Trojan War, but his son Eurypylus fought on the side of the Trojans. This material was dealt with in a number of tragedies, such as Aeschylus Mygi, Sophocles Aelidi, and Euripides Telephus and Og, 
but Pergamon does not seem to have played any role in any of them. The adaptation of the myth is not entirely smooth. Thus, on the one hand, Eurypylus who must have been part of the dynastic line as a result of the appropriation of the myth, was not mentioned in the hymn sung in honor of Telephus in the Asclepion. Otherwise he does not seem to have been paid any heed. But the Pergamonese made offerings to Telephus and the grave of his mother Og was located in Pergamon near the Caicus. Pergamon thus entered the Trojan epic cycle, with its ruler said to have been an Arcadian who had fought with Telephus against Agamemnon when he landed at the Caicus, mistook it for Troy and began to ravage the land. On the other hand, the story was linked to the foundation of the city with another myth, that of Pergamus, the eponymous hero of the city. He also belonged to the broader cycle of myths related to the Trojan War as the grandson of Achilles through his father Neoptolemus and of Priam through his mother Andromache. With his mother, he was said to have fled to Mysia where he killed the ruler of Tuthrania and gave the city his own name. There he built a harun for his mother after her death. In a less heroic version, Grinos the son of Eurypylus named a city after him in gratitude for a favor. These mythic connections seem to be late and are not attested before the 3rd century BC. Pergamus' role remained subordinate, although he did receive some cult worship. Beginning in the Roman period, his image appears on civic coinage and he is said to have had a harun in the city. Even so, he provided a further, deliberately crafted link to the world of Homeric epic. Mithridates VI was celebrated in the city as a new Pergamus. However, for the Adelids, it was apparently the genealogical connection to Heracles that was crucial since all the other Hellenistic dynasties had long established such links, the Ptolemies derived themselves directly from Heracles, the Antigonids inserted Heracles into their family tree in the reign of Philip V at the end of the 3rd century BC at the latest, and the Seleucids claimed descent from Heracles' brother Apollo. All of these claims derive their significance from Alexander the Great, who claimed descent from Heracles, through his father Philip II. In their constructive adaptation of the myth, the Adelids stood within the tradition of the other, older Hellenistic dynasties, who legitimized themselves through divine descent, and sought to increase their own prestige. The inhabitants of Pergamon enthusiastically followed their lead and took to calling themselves Telephidae and referring to Pergamon itself in poetic registers as the Telephian city. The first mention of Pergamon after ancient times comes from the 13th century. Beginning with Syracus of Ancona in the 15th century, ever more travelers visited the place and published their accounts of it. The key description is that of Thomas Smith, who visited the Levant in 1668 and transmitted a detailed description of Pergamon, which the great 17th century travelers Jacob Spahn and George Weller were able to add nothing significant to in their own accounts. In the late 18th century, these visits were reinforced by a scholarly desire for research, epitomized by Marie-Gabriel Florent Augusta de choiseul Gouffier, a traveller in Asia Minor and French ambassador to the sublime port in Istanbul from 1784 to 1791. At the beginning of the 19th century, Charles Robert Cockerell produced a detailed account and Otto Magnus von Stack Elberg made important sketches. A proper, multi-page description with plans, elevations, and views of the city and its ruins was first produced by Charles Texier when he published the second volume of his description de Elasi Minur. In 1864-5, the German engineer Karl Heumann visited Pergamon for the first time. 
for the construction of the road from Pergamon to Dikili for which he had undertaken planning work and topographical studies, he returned in 1869 and began to focus intensively on the legacy of the city. In 1871, he organized a small expedition there under the leadership of Ernst Curtius. As a result of this short but intensive investigation, two fragments of a great frieze were discovered and transported to Berlin for detailed analysis, where they received some interest, but not a lot. It is not clear who connected these fragments with the great altar in Pergamon mentioned by Lucius Ampelius. However, when the archaeologist Alexander Kahn's took over direction of the Department of Ancient Sculpture at the Royal Museums of Berlin, he quickly initiated a program for the excavation and protection of the monuments connected to the sculpture, which were widely suspected to include the Great Altar. As a result of these efforts, Karl Heumann, who had been carrying out low-level excavations at Pergamon for the previous few years and had discovered for example the architrave inscription of the Temple of Demeter in 1875, was entrusted with carry-out work in the area of the Altar of Zeus in 1878, where he continued to work until 1886. With the approval of the Ottoman Empire, the reliefs discovered there were transported to Berlin, where the Pergamon Museum was opened for them in 1907. The work was continued by Kahn's, who aimed for the most complete possible exposure and investigation of the historic city and citadel that was possible. He was followed by the architectural historian Wilhelm Dorpfeld from 1900 to 1911, who was responsible for the most important discoveries. Under his leadership the Lower Agora, the House of Adelos, the Gymnasion, and the Sanctuary of Demeter were brought to light. The excavations were interrupted by the First World War and were only resumed in 1927 under the leadership of Theodore Wigand, who remained in this post until 1939. He concentrated on further excavation of the upper city, the Asclepian, and the Red Hall. The Second World War also caused a break in work at Pergamon, which lasted until 1957. From 1957 to 1968, Eric Beringer worked on the Asclepian in particular but also carried out important work on the lower city as a whole and performed survey work, which increased knowledge of the countryside surrounding the city. In 1971, after a short pause, Wolfgang Rad succeeded him as leader of excavations and directed the focus of research on the residential buildings of Pergamon, but also on technical issues like the water management system of the city which supported a population of 200,000 at its height. He also carried out conservation projects which were of vital importance for maintaining the material remains of Pergamon. Since 2006, the excavations have been led by Felix Persson. Most of the finds from the Pergamon excavations before the Frist World War were taken to the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, with a smaller portion going to the Istanbul Archaeological Museum after it was opened in 1891. After the First World War the Bergama Museum was opened, which has received all finds discovered since then. Pergamon is a good example of a city that expanded in a planned and controlled manner. Philoteros transformed Pergamon from an archaic settlement into a fortified city. He or his successor Adelos I built a wall around the whole upper city, including the plateau to the south, the upper agora and some of the housing, further housing must have been found outside these walls. Because of the growth of the city, the streets were expanded and the city was monumentalist. Under Adelos I some minor changes were made to the city of Philoteros. During the reign of Eumenes II and Adelos II, 
there was a substantial expansion of the city. A new street network was created and a new city wall with a monumental gatehouse south of the Acropolis called the Gate of Eumenes. The wall, with numerous gates, now surrounded the entire hill, not just the upper city and the flat area to the southwest, all the way to the Selenus River. Numerous public buildings were constructed, as well as a new marketplace south of the Acropolis and a new gymnasium in the east. The southeast slope and the whole western slope of the hill were now settled and opened up by streets. The plan of Pergamon was affected by the extreme steepness of the site. As a result of this, the streets had to turn hairpin corners, so that the hill could be climbed as comfortably and quickly as possible. For the construction of buildings and laying out of the agoras, extensive work on the cliff face and terracing had to be carried out. A consequence of the city's growth was the construction of new buildings over old ones, since there was not sufficient space. Separate from this, a new area was laid out in Roman times, consisting of a whole new city west of the Selenus River, with all necessary infrastructure, including baths, theatres, stadiums, and sanctuaries. This Roman new city was able to expand without any city walls constraining it because of the absence of external threats. The royal palaces, the Haruna shrine where the kings of Pergamon, particularly Adelasi and Eumenes II, were worshipped, the upper agora, the Roman baths complex, Diodorus Pasporos Herun, Arsenals. Notes The upper gymnasium, the middle gymnasium, the lower gymnasium, the temple of Demeter, the house of Attalus, the lower agora and, the gate of Eumenes. The Roman theatre, the north stoa, the south stoa, the temple of Asclepius a circular treatment center, a healing spring, an underground passageway, a library, the Via Tecta and, a propylon. Generally, most of the Hellenistic houses at Pergamon were laid out with a small, centrally located and roughly square courtyard, with rooms on one or two sides of it. The main rooms are often stacked in two levels on the north side of the courtyard. A wide passage or colonnade on the north side of the courtyard often opened onto foyers, which enabled access to other rooms. An exact north-south arrangement of the city blocks was not possible because of the topographical situation and earlier construction. Thus the size and arrangement of the rooms differed from house to house. From the time of Philoteros, at the latest, this kind of courtyard house was common and it was ever more widespread as time went on, but not universal. Some complexes were designed as prostas houses, similar to designs seen at Preen. Others had wide columned halls in front of main rooms to the north. Especially in this latter type there is often a second story accessed by stairways. In the courtyards there were often cisterns, which captured rainwater from the sloping roofs above. For the construction under Eumenes II, a city block of 35x 45m can be reconstructed, subject to significant variation as a result of the terrain. From the beginning of the reign of Philoteros, civic events in Pergamon were concentrated on the Acropolis. Over time the so-called Upper Agora was developed at the south end of this. In the reign of Adelos I, a temple of Zeus was built there. To the north of this structure there was a multi-story building, which probably had a function connected to the marketplace. With progressive development of the open space, these buildings were demolished while the upper agora itself took on a more strongly commercial function, while still a special space as a result of the Temple of Zeus. In the course of the expansion of the city under Eumenes, 
the commercial character of the Upper Agora was further developed. The key signs of this development are primarily the halls built under Yumin's II, whose back chambers were probably used for trade. In the west, the west chamber was built which might have served as a market administration building. After these renovations, the upper agora thus served as a center for trade and spectacle in the city. Because of significant new construction in the immediate vicinity, the renovation of the sanctuary of Athena and the Pergamon altar and the redesign of the neighboring area, the design and organizational principle of the upper agora underwent a further change. Its character became much more spectacular and focused on the two new structures looming over it especially the altar which was visible on its terrace from below since the usual stoa surrounding it was omitted from the design. The 80m long and 55m wide lower agora was built under Yumin's II and was not significantly altered until late antiquity. As with the upper agora, the rectangular form of the agora was adapted to the steep terrain. The construction consisted in total of three levels. Of these the upper level and the main level opened onto a central courtyard. On the lower level there were rooms only on the south and east sides because of the slope of the land, which led through a colonnade to the exterior of the space. The whole market area extended over two levels with a large columned hall in the center, which contained small shop spaces and miscellaneous rooms. The course of the main street which winds up the hill to the Acropolis with a series of hairpin turns, is typical of the street system of Pergamon. On this street were shops and warehouses. The surface of the street consisted of andesite blocks up to 5 meters wide, 1 meter long and 30 centimeters deep. The street included a drainage system, which carried the water down the slope. Since it was the most important street of the city, the quality of the material used in its construction was very high. Filatero's design of the city was shaped above all by circumstantial considerations. Only under Yumin's too was this approach discarded and the city plan begins to show signs of an overall plan. Contrary to earlier attempts at an orthogonal street system, a fan-shaped design seems to have been adopted for the area around the gymnasium, with streets up to 4 meters wide, apparently intended to enable effective traffic flow. In contrast to it, Filatero's system of alleys was created unsystematically, although the topic is still under investigation. Where the lay of the land prevented the laying of a street, small alleys were installed as connections instead. In general therefore, there are large, broad streets and small, narrow connecting streets. The nearly 200-meter-wide Pergamon Bridge under the forecourt of the Red Basilica in the center of Bergama, is the largest bridge substruction from antiquity. The inhabitants of Pergamon were supplied with water by an effective system. In addition to cisterns, there was a system of nine pipes. The most famous structure from the city is the monumental altar, which was probably dedicated to Zeus and Athena. The foundations are still located in the upper city, but the remains of the Pergamon frieze, which originally decorated it, are displayed in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin where the parts F.O. the frieze taken to Germany have been installed in a partial reconstruction. For the altar's construction, the required flat area was skillfully created through terracing, in order to allow it to be oriented in relation to the neighboring temple of Athena. The base of the altar measured around 36 x 33 meters and was decorated on the outside with a detailed depiction in high relief of the gigantomachy, the battle between the Olympian gods and the giants. The frieze is 2.30 meters high and has a total length of 113 meters, making it the second longest frieze surviving from antiquity, 
after the Parthenon freeze in Athens. A 20-meter wide staircase cut into the base on the western side leads up to the upper structure, which is surrounded by a colonnade, and consists of a colonnaded courtyard, separated from the staircase by a colonnade. The interior walls of this colonnade had a further frieze, depicting the life of Telephus, the son of Heracles and mythical founder of Pergamon. This frieze is around 1.60 meters high and thus is clearly smaller than the outer frieze. The well-preserved theater dates from the Hellenistic period and had space for around 10,000 people, in 78 rows of seats. At a height of 36 meters, it is the steepest of all ancient theaters. The seating area is divided horizontally by two walkways, called diazomata, and vertically by 0.75 meter wide stairways into seven sections in the lowest part of the theater and six in the middle and upper sections. Below the theater is a 247 meter long and up to 17.4 meter wide terrace which rested on a high retaining wall and was framed on the long side by a stoa. Coming from the upper market, one could enter this from a tower building at the south end. This terrace had no space for the circular orchestra which was normal in a Greek theatre, so only a wooden stage building was built which could be taken down when there was no performance taking place. Thus, the view along the terrace to the Temple of Dionysus at the northern end was unimpeded. A marble stage building was only built in the 1st century BC. Additional theatres were built in the Roman period, one in the Roman New City and the other in the Sanctuary of Asclepius. At Pergamon, Dionysus had the epithet Cothesimon, the guide, and was already worshipped in the last third of the 3rd century BC, when the Attalids made him the chief god of their dynasty. In the 2nd century BC, Eumenes II built a temple for Dionysus at the northern end of the theatre terrace. The marble temple sits on a podium, 4.5 metres above the level of the theatre terrace and was an Ionic pro-style temple. The pronaos was four columns wide and two columns deep and was accessed by a staircase of 25 steps. Only a few traces of the Hellenistic structure survive. The majority of the surviving structure derives from a reconstruction of the temple which probably took place under Caracalla, or perhaps under Hadrian. Pergamon's oldest temple is a sanctuary of Athena from the 4th century BC. It was a north-facing Doric Peripteros temple with six columns on the short side and ten on the long side and a cella divided into two rooms. The foundations, measuring around 12.70 x 21.80 meters, are still visible today. The columns were around 5.25 meters high, 0.75 meters in diameter and the distance between the columns was 1.62 meters, so the colonnade was very light for a temple of this period. This is matched by the shape of the triglyphs, which usually consist of a sequence of two triglyphs and two metopes, but are instead composed of three of triglyphs and three metopes. The columns of the temple are unfluted and retained bossage but it is not clear whether this was a result of carelessness or incompleteness. A two-story stoa surrounding the temple on three sides was added under Eumenes II, along with the propylon in the southeast corner, which is now found, largely reconstructed, in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. The balustrade of the upper level of the north and east stoas was decorated with reliefs depicting weapons which commemorated Eumenes II's military victory. The construction mixed ionic columns and Doric triglyphs. In the area of the sanctuary, Adelos I and Eumenes II constructed victory monuments, most notably the Gallic dedications. The northern stoa seems to have been the site of the Library of Pergamon.
The Library of Pergamon was the second largest in the ancient Greek world after the Library of Alexandria, containing at least 200,000 scrolls. The location of the library building is not certain. Since the 19th century excavations, it has generally been identified with an annex of the northern stoa of the Sanctuary of Athena in the Upper Citadel, which was built by Eumenes II. Inscriptions in the gymnasium which mention a library might indicate, however, that the building was located in that area. On the highest point of the citadel is the temple for Trajan and Zeus Philios. The temple sits on a 2.9 meter high podium on top of a vaulted terrace. The temple itself was a Corinthian Peripteros temple about 18 meters wide with six columns on the short sides and nine columns on the long sides, and two rows of columns in antis. To the north, the area was closed off by a high stoa, while on the west and east sides it was surrounded by simple ashlar walls, until further stoas were inserted in Hadrian's reign. During the excavations fragments of statues of Trajan and Hadrian were found in the rubble of Sella, including their portrait heads, as well as fragments of the cult statue of Zeus Philios. Other notable structures still in existence on the upper part of the Acropolis include the site is today easily accessible by the Bergama Acropolis gondola from the base station in northeastern Bergama. The lower part of the Acropolis has the following structures. The Sanctuary of Hera Basilea lay north of the upper terrace of the gymnasium. Its structure sits on two parallel terraces, the south one about 107.4 meters above sea level and the north one about 109.8 meters above sea level. The Temple of Hera sat in the middle of the upper terrace facing to the south, with a six-meter-wide exedra to the west and a building whose function is very unclear to the east. The two terraces were linked by a staircase of 11 steps around 7.5 meters wide, descending from the front of the temple. The temple was about 7 meters wide by 12 meters long, and sat on a three-stepped foundation. It was a Doric tetra-style pro-style temple, with three triglyphs and metopes for each span in the entablature. All the other buildings in the sanctuary were made out of track height, but the visible part of the temple was made of marble, or at least had a marble cladding. The base of the cult image inside the cella supported three cult statues. The surviving remains of the inscription on the architrave indicate that the building was the temple of Hera Basileia and that it was erected by Attalus II. Three kilometers south of the Acropolis at, down in the valley, there was the sanctuary of Asclepius, the god of healing. The Asclepium was approached along an 820-meter colonnaded sacred way. In this place people with health problems could bathe in the water of the sacred spring, and in the patient's dreams Asclepius would appear in a vision to tell them how to cure their illness. Archaeology has found lots of gifts and dedications that people would make afterwards, such as small terracotta body parts, no doubt representing what had been healed. Galen the most famous doctor in the ancient Roman Empire and personal physician of Emperor Marcus Aurelius, worked in the Asclepium for many years. Notable extant structures in the Asclepium include Pergamon's other notable structure is the great temple of the Egyptian gods Isis and Slash or Serapis, known today as the Red Basilica, about one kilometer south of the Acropolis at it consists of a main building and two round towers within an enormous temenos or sacred area. The temple towers flanking the main building had courtyards with pools used for ablutions at each end, flanked by stoas on three sides. According to tradition, in the year 92 St. Antipas, the first bishop of Pergamum ordained by John the Apostle, 
was a victim of an early clash between Serapis worshippers and Christians. An angry mob is said to have burned Saint Antipas alive inside a brazen bull incense burner, which represented the bull god Apis. The Christian community in Pergamum was one of the seven churches to which the Book of Revelation was addressed. The forecourt of the Temple of Isis slash Serapis is still supported by the 193-meter-wide Pergamon Bridge, the largest bridge substruction of antiquity. Greek inscriptions discovered at Pergamon include the rules of the town clerks, the so-called Astinomoi inscription, which has added to understanding of Greek municipal laws and regulations, including how roads were kept in repair regulations regarding the public and private water supply and lavatories.